Hello, and welcome to Eastgate Community Church. We are so glad you've joined us to listen to this message from our weekend encounter. We pray you are encouraged by what you are about to hear. We're on a continuing track this morning. We, we started off and we've been doing somewhat of establishing cultures and establishing pillars within this community. Uh, we started off with multi multi uh, generational families um, that God is marrying the generations that He's He's bringing the 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 young blondes with the grays. Amen. Come on, gray represents wisdom, right? And so um, He's marrying these two realities. He's marrying the couples that are young and that have that are more mature. And listen, I won't say old because so many people will say, "Well, it's not 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 politically correct." But, um, but you're old in the Lord in the sense that you're seasoned. And, um, and we're seeing this, this gap bridge. There's a gap. And um, uh, Jane and, and uh, Scott shared on that just so beautifully about how we're doing that, how the Lord's really raising up mothers and fathers. Um, I believe that the Lord has given us some amazing mothers. Um, Lisa, amazing mother in the Lord. Janet, amazing mother in the Lord. Mary, yep, amazing mother in the Lord. Um, Hannah, mother of the Lord, right? I mean, we've got young, we've got more experience, but um, the Lord's really raising up that that maternal uh, instinct that is within you, uh, and He's marrying it with leadership. And we're seeing we're seeing just the perfect leadership of Jesus begin to arise, and it's amazing. The following week, we discussed what it looked like to be a, a worshiping community, what it means to be a worship lifestyle before the Lord, and. Last week, we talked about apostolic communities. And um, if you guys weren't here, how many of you weren't here last week? Okay, just, just a brief synopsis. We talked about what an apostolic community is centered around. It's centered around a sent message that, that the Lord has brought to a region uh, to, to usher in the word of the Lord, to see effectual change, and to raise up leaders, right? We're committed to to raising up leaders. And so apostolic communities look different because they're smaller, they're more intimate, um, they're more intentional, and uh, and they we guys we grow small, we multiply one by one, two by two, because it's 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 the divine connection of the Lord. The Lord connects us and the Lord appoints that connection. I believe that what I shared this morning about people being AWOL is um, Many that are AWOL are not walking in the, in the connection that the Lord has provided, the divine connection. And, um, and the Lord never, never mandated and commissioned us to do this alone. Amen. Hello. That's right. Isolation will, will, will destroy you. It, it, will, it will kill you. You will become, you'll lose your vision. You'll lose, you'll lose your passion. You will let offense. You'll harbor. All these things will come up. And they will come not only just to separate the relationship, but they will come to separate and very make your heart cold. Because that's what the enemy does. He isolates you. He takes you away from the 99 sheep and the 99 of the sheep. Now listen, this is a little bit different. But he takes you away and then he picks you off. And so never allow yourself to be isolated. Um, and today we're going we're gonna to talk about a place called home. Amen? Everybody say home. home. You know, my mama always said, <laughs> mama, 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 mama said, mama, my mama always said, uh, life is like a box of chocolates. No, <laughs> she didn't say that. But she said that if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody, ain't nobody happy. And she used to have this 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 poster on in the bathroom, and it was like PMS. <laughs> well, I had no idea what PMS was, but my mom my mom certainly told me what it was. Um, and I don't know why I said that. <laughs> but anyways, we're talking this morning about a place called home, and. We're going to actually talk about uh, prayer this morning. Amen. Because we are a community that believes highly in prayer. Uh, in the book of Acts, the, the disciples of that time that were waiting, the 120 that were waiting in the upper room, that the fire of God fell. And it says that each one sat a flame on each one of them. I Meaning each flame was different. But they were waiting. They were waiting in a place of prayer. They were waiting on the fulfillment, which Jesus told them. In John chapter 14, wait for the promise, wait for the comforter, wait for the instructor. There's one who's coming and he's going to teach you in all things. He's going to lead you in all things. 
And, um, and he's going to, uh, John 14, 12, enter you into the greater works. They're going to do the same things and greater things. And uh, which, God, you just find that amazing? Like when you read the Old Testament and you read up to that place, it's like Jesus is saying, you're going to do greater things. Bible says Elijah was a man with a nature like you and I, with a nature like anybody in this room. Yet when he prayed, it didn't rain. That's right. That's right. And yet when the Lord said it's time, he prayed, it rained. And, and so my point is, is that um, so much happens in the place of prayer. The place of prayer is all, it's, it's, it's all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And in the book of Acts, the, the church, the community at the time, they were centered around fellowship. They were centered around the breaking of bread. They were centered around the apostolic teaching, which we talked about apostolic communities. Apostolic communities have apostolic teaching. And apostolic teaching is... It's not a good inspirational message. It's not a message that's going to be designed to stroke your ego or to make you feel good. Now, it will make you feel good because it's life. But apostolic message means that we don't have time to mess around. We have been sent. We, ha we, are, we, are, we are bringing, we're bringing community around a message saying, listen, as the Lord has sent me, so I send you. And people that want to sit in chairs and don't want to live a sent reality, there's going to be resistance. There's going to be stiff neckness. There's going to be obstinance against stepping into this sent reality and embracing this apostolic message for the hour because apostolic people, they will drive you insane. They will either be your, uh, one, one person told me, they will either be uh, your mentor or they will be your tormentor. <laughs> they will either inspire you or they will make you hate them. And it won't be the ability, their, their, their ability that makes you hate them. It'll be because you just want them to shut up. But they won't shut up. They won't, they won't put up. They won't go home. They just, they have one reality to call people into greater truth, greater walk, and demand that you walk in your calling. That's an apostolic community. And everyone embraces, everyone walks around that and says, listen, God loved you enough to die for you so he could actually get you in the, in the game. So apostolic communities are getting us in the game and apostolic teaching inspires you to step into who you are and to step into the game and begin to win the day like Jesus did. But the other thing that was centered around was prayer. Um, everybody say prayer. prayer. Who here loves prayer? Come on. You, we, I mean, I don't. I honestly, when I was preparing for this message, I, I, um, I, I was like, I could have gone in so many different directions. Um, and again, I don't know what direction we'll go in. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I did kind of methodically, uh, you know, was taking this before the Lord, and, and He was giving me kind of an outline how we, how we would, we would flow. But specifically, title of this message: A Place Called Home. And in Isaiah chapter 56, if you guys will turn there with me in your Bibles, on your iPhones. The spirit of iPhone has come upon me. Uh, this is now this is uh, this, the salvation message to the Gentiles for this chapter that they've broken this out. And he says in verse six. Also, the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath. He's talking about defiling uh, the holy day, which every day now is a holy day and holds fast my covenant. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices Will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations come on so what he, what he's saying there is and i looked up this translation is when he's talking about a house he's talking about a quote-unquote home so we talked about saying home is where the heart is listen god's heart is in the place of prayer that's where we find his heart. That's where he conforms our heart. That's where he melts our heart. That's where he comes and he separates things from what's true and what's not true. And there's always greater realms of truth that you and I have yet to walk in. If we think that we've got the truth of something right now and we've got the fullness of it, we will find ourselves deceived. 
Because you may have truth and revelation today about something, but the Lord will peel back that another layer of revelation and he will add something to that. And he, and he says this in, in scripture. He says, if you are my sons and you will abide in my word, you will be my disciple and the truth shall set you free. Truth will make you free. Right. It's the revelation that you have that you're stepping into that gives you truth that actually gives you the ability to walk in freedom. If you're walking in some sort of sin right now, it's because you don't really know the truth. And if you don't know the truth experientially, that truth cannot set you free. That's right. So if you look at your life in a mirror and you say, well, this, these are my, these are things I'm struggling with. Well, you just need to apply the truth in that matter. And then, and then that truth will set you free in Jesus name. Amen. That was free. Amen. So, um, the, the history of prayer, there's a history, uh, to the place of prayer and it starts with Genesis to Revelation. Uh, first, we have God um, with man in the garden. God, God was walking with man. The tree of life was there. That's what they were, they were eating. Adam was eating of it. He was tasting of it. And that, and that sinful woman Eve. Oh, my goodness. Sinful woman Eve. And so then we have. You're right. You're right. God, then we have God apart from man. And New Covenant theology is God with man. Okay. So in all these different places, we have, um, we have a history all throughout. And this, this paints the picture from Genesis to Revelation. And there's a, there, and prayer is lying in all three of these. You can call them dispensations. Now, if you want to, if here's, here's what I, I'm not really a, a theologian and I like to make things simple. So when I talk about dispensations, you know what I think about? <laughs> this is going to make you laugh. So, Toilet paper. Dispensary. When you pull on the toilet paper, it's being dispensed. That's, hello, a dispensation. That's revelation. You're pulling on it, except it never runs out. And guess what it's for? It's for wiping your rear end. Hello. That'll preach. So, God with man, God apart from man, and um, oh God, yeah, God with man, God apart from man. God in man, man. Wow, you guys did you guys should have corrected me. Hey, listen. You want to you want, okay, here's another thing about apostolic communities. Y'all ready for this? Apostolic communities correct one another. You don't say, well, you're the leader. I'm not supposed to correct you. Who taught you that? Come on. What makes me more of a leader than you? Nothing. Think about that. Chew on that for a while. Um, so, so in Genesis thirteen four, Abraham is is he's walking with the Lord, and it actually says in in um, in, the, in that passage that he created an altar. He created an altar, and there he began to call upon the name of the Lord. And at, up to that point in time, no one, no one had ever created an altar. No one had ever called upon the name of the Lord. So what in the world was he thinking? What was he thinking? I'd like to know. I, I like, you know, one of these days I just, I'm just going to build this altar. I'm going to call upon God. Obviously he had revelation to do it. Um, so within these three dispensations, um, you have, you have these different um, expressions that prayer was, prayer was made. The first one was prayer was made through altars. Um, like I said, began in, in Genesis chapter chapter three with with Abraham. Actually, Genesis chapter thirteen, and then after that, you have you have the tabernacle, which we know the tabernacle was constructed by a man that was full of the Spirit. He was an artesian, and he was the first man that the Spirit of God fell on. First man ever, and he was actually a craftsman. He was, and he, he and he he designed the Ark of the Covenant. He designed everything. With the, with the tabernacle of the Lord. If you guys have ever studied the tabernacle or the temple, everything in it is prophetic of that which was to come through Jesus. And Jesus has fulfilled it all, uh, which is amazing. The third was, was the temple, which we know that David, um, David did a 24-7 uh, tabernacle, right? But it wasn't until his son came that the Lord said, I'm ready for a house. I want to be in a house. And um, so you can see a building up of 
how the Lord is manifesting himself through the people that are coming to build something for him. And this is all intertwined with prayer. It's all the connection. Well, then you have, then you have Jesus that comes. And now we have man. Now, through all five of these expressions, Jesus has come, uh, or the Lord, the Lord has designed this progression of, um, of acceleration. But prayer has always been the connecting point. It holds everything together. Um, so there's just so many different facets about prayer that, that, that we can, we can teach, teach about. Um, life began in Genesis in a garden. Revelation 22, we end in a garden. The crux of very, the walk of Christ if, in the garden of, of Gethsemane, which was on the mountain of olives, it was in a garden where Jesus drank of the cup and said, I choose to die. He really didn't choose to die on the cross. He really chose to die in a garden when he drank of the cup and said, Lord, this is too hard for me. But he said, nevertheless, if, you're, if, 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 um, if, you, if you want this for me, I will drink of it. You and I have a cup to drink of. And um, isn't it amazing that he drank of that cup in the place of the Mount of Olives, which the olives are the pressing. See, he was fully being pressed in the place. If you ever go to Jerusalem, if you ever sit in that, in the, in the, in the, on, you climb the Mount of Olives and you go into the Garden of Gethsemane, there's olive trees everywhere. And, um, and you can just sit in it and you can just look right into the eastern gate and see where it's sealed. And you can see the temple on the other side. It's beautiful. Um, and you just get such a reality. This is where Jesus was going through agony and pain and so much so that he was bleeding blood. Um, and Jesus showed us what it was like um, to actually live a lifestyle of prayer, to live without, without, without ceasing, right, to pray. Now, you and I would say... What does that look like? Like, I mean, when I first started praying, I, I'd go into a room and I didn't know how to pray. I, I, I had no understanding. I would go in and I, I took this little, um, this, this little grid, this little graph, kind of like a pie chart, and it broke down the Lord's Prayer. It was, it was Larry Lee. Uh, Larry Lee's Could You Not Tarry One Hour, which that revelation was given right here in this region. Come on. And I believe the Lord is accelerating that revelation. And um, but prayer is so it's so ingrained in this in this region. And um, and I go in the room and I just would God I just cry out to God. I'm like God, I have to know how to pray. I have to know how to pray. And I would beat my head against the wall. And it's like I just wrestled with that. And the Lord began to show me like how to pray. Now if I went back to to where I was when I started, which was so great and the presence of the Lord was on it, I would put myself in such an ensnarement because I was praying. I was praying to the best of my ability. The Lord was leading me, but he was training me. He was training me how to do something, but how he was training me really to be it. He was training me really to step into his presence. He was training me to, to where I would not just go into the place of prayer, but I would live from the place of prayer. Where my lifestyle would become an incense before the Lord. Where, where I would become a sweet smelling incense to him all the time. Where I would meditate on him. I would think about him. I would, I would voice out of my mouth. I would, I would just, my very eyes of looking at people would be an incense to the Lord. Listen, we think of prayer so rigidly. Yeah. We think of prayer just as uh, like Anna in the temple. Listen, some people are called to that. Some people have a, a, a calling of separation in prayer. Janet does. Janet, Janet loves to pray. And if you ever get around Janet, Jan, what's Janet going to do? Janet's going to want to go pray, right? <laughs> Praise God. That, that is a gift that the Lord's put upon her. But let me tell you something. It is a gift, but prayer is not a gift. Come on. It's not. There's nowhere in the Bible that says prayer is a gift. That's right. it's, 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 it's relationship. Yeah, it's, relationship. It's, it's, it's walking through the door and it's spending time with him. It's getting to know his heart. It's, it's allowing him to just put the oil of intimacy on your life where you become a living incense, where you become a sweet smelling aroma before the Lord and people just get around you and they're like, is that Stetson? <laughs> <laughs> Who wears Stetson in here? Who wears Stetson? <laughs> ah, yeah, come on. Woo! Old Spice. Man, I love those Old Spice commercials. <laughs> That's so funny. But... But in the garden is the tree of life. 
In the garden is the tree of life, guys. In the place of prayer is the tree of life to eat of the fruit of God. And, I, and the Lord told me a couple of years ago, he said, I'm going to use your life to merge worship and prayer where they will be one. You won't be able to separate them. Where your life becomes worship, your life becomes prayer. Man, I'm just a walking place. I just want to be a walking place of incense that, that is constantly pleasing to the Lord. I, 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 I want to see signs, wonders, miracles, and healings. But I know that if, I, if he has my heart and I have his heart, I will become a sign and a wonder in the earth. I know that you will become a sign and a wonder in the earth. When, when you just lock upon the eyes of your beloved. And guys, it's the place of prayer is where we encounter him. It's, um, it's the place where he encounters us. It's the place where he breaks our heart. Like David said, break my heart for what breaks your heart. Yeah. It's the place of brokenness. It's the place of, listen, when you go into the place of prayer and you can't turn it off. <coughs> anybody know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what that means? That you can't turn it off. It means you have become so distracted by the voices in this world that, that, that you fail to be able to shut them down. In the place of prayer, the Lord silences everything. The secret place silences, um, it silences the thoughts of the accuser. It silences the opinions of man. It silences all the fears and the trepidations, all the failures. Everything just begins to fall because it's just the silence waiting on the Lord. And as that begins to, to happen, the Lord begins to train your mind. So many of us, we operate out of logic. But, and the Lord has made some of us to be logical. But in the place of prayer, the Lord bypasses your intellect. And he goes and he pierces your heart. And he begins to let that which he pierces your heart, the seed comes out. And it begins to bear fruit. It begins to, uh, he begins to turn your heart into a garden. Into a place where he can come and he can live with you. In a place where... You can abide in him where you can step into him and he can step into you. It's one thing to it's one thing to be in God, but what does it mean for him to be in you? Yeah. It's in the place of prayer where we really find out what it means to abide in God and um and to really walk with him. So I would encourage you, if you get in a room and you just you just can't shut it down, you have to linger. You have to learn how to linger. You have to just listen, go to a place where you can just blank it all out. Go to a place where you can just get out the dry eraser and just start doing this in your mind. You have to learn how to how to pull down those your mind, your thoughts. You have to learn. That's called partnering with God. It's really not you doing it. It's really Him. And He'll give you the grace to pull it all down, to make it all blank, because He wants to come and write on it. Yeah. He wants to come write His with the finger of God. And that's where He begins to come speak to you. You know, the greatest facet of prayer, it's the craziest thing. God speaks to you, you hear him, and you speak it back to him. Yeah. Who does that? <laughs> like, like, why wouldn't God just sovereignly just make it happen and with, without us? But he won't. One of my greatest frustrations is people that think God's just going to do something because he spoke it. Yeah. That's not true. Come on. There's nowhere in the Bible where God spoke something, well... I'm not going to say that. God can speak something and he can do it and he will do it regardless if man. But listen, if that happens that way, you're not going to like the result. Yeah. You're not going to like the judgment that's going to come to get the hearts where it needs to be to actually fulfill his word. You're not going to like it. His word will come to pass, but he's going to do it in a way that you're not going to like it. And had you been willing to just listen to what he was saying and hear what he was saying and actually be the hands and feet. Listen, God he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand while I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus is at the right hand of God and he's ever living to make intercession for you and I. Right now, listen, right now Jesus is interceding for this meeting. He's sitting there, he's praying to the Father. And, and you know, angels ascending, descending, going up and down, to and fro. And we're partnering with what he's saying. If we can't hear him, how are we partnering with what he's doing? Prayer is, is for relationship, but effectual prayer causes change. Effectual prayer changes you before it changes your circumstance. Yeah, that's right. Effectual prayer, the very thing you're called to is the very thing the Lord will make you into. If you want to know what's the Lord doing in my life, what's he changing in you? Because that which he's changing in you, you are becoming a messenger to be to give the message. Right? 
He's giving a message of intercession. You're catching it. That's what you're becoming. You're becoming the very message to the me to, um, the very message of the messenger. So, so many of us want to be a messenger, but the thing is, God's called me to be a messenger. God's called Lisa to be a messenger. God's called Eric to be a messenger. Do you know what he's doing right now? He's conforming them to the image of the message in which they're going to carry. Yeah. So we want, we want to be released, but the thing is, I'm conforming you so you actually represent my nature, my character, to actually not only give the message, but have the ability to actually people to see it. So you're becoming a living epistle read by all men. People are reading you. Do you want to know how they're going to read you? They're going to read you by looking at what's written on your life. If it hasn't been written on your heart, yeah. you will not, you will not reveal to what it, what it, what it's, what it looks like to him. That's right. He has to bypass your mind. He has to get it in your heart and then your heart becomes it. Then you become out of the abundance of your heart, you become the overflow of that, which he's done in your heart. Yeah. This is all about the heart. Mm -hmm. Remember home is where the heart is. The house of prayer is it, it's, it's the heartbeat of God. And, um, Everybody turn to Isaiah chapter uh, 55, 11 through 13. It says this, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sin. it. Everybody say prosper. Prosper. For you shall go out with joy. Everybody say joy. Joy. And be let out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Oh my gosh. Everybody clap your hands. <laughs> What's it going to look like to see the trees clap their hands? I believe this is, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. They're worshiping. Yeah. All creation's groaning for the sons of God to, to yeah. walk the earth so that, so that the environment and the trees can clap their hands. Instead of the thorns, listen, wow. Instead of the thorns shall come up the cypress tree. And instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. Myrtle means uh, to be hidden, to be undercover. Hidden in righteousness is actually what it means. And it shall be to the Lord for a name and for an everlasting sign that, that, that shall not be cut off. So God wants to make you into an everlasting sign that cannot be cut off. Amen. Right? And he wants to do it to be the word of the Lord, right? To be actually, to be the word of the Lord to where you are. And so what is he saying here? He's saying that my word that has gone forth, even out of Genesis, he spoke the word and it went forth. Right. And then all creation started aligning and started, you know, planets and he spoke everything into existence. You know what the Lord was showing me? You and I, Mark 16, where it says, go ye therefore. You and I, when it was when in the book of Acts, when he says, um, you'll be a witness unto Samaria and Jerusalem and to um, and the uttermost parts of the world. You and I are a prophetic fulfillment of a prayer that was prayed. That is still being that is still being ushered forth. When Paul had an apostolic prayer in Second Thessalonians, he says, "Pray that the Lord that the word of the Lord will run swiftly." It was an apostolic decree and saying, "You've been sent," and this prayer is being captured and it's being captivated, guys. It's being captivated right here. It was captivated by this man Jesus. Yes. It was fully capped on the word became flesh. Right, the word, the prayer that was prayed in heaven has become flesh, mm -hmm. and it has dwelt amongst us. And because, because we are taking on the nature of Jesus as we're being conformed to his image, as we're praying, as he prayed, as he came to reveal the Father, and he spent time with the Father. And as he spent time with him, the Lord began to reveal his will for his life. And he began to appoint men, 12 men. Do you know that the Lord has appointed you? Yes. Do you know that, that, that he's putting you in a place where, um, where you're going to... Uh, where you're going to become this passage, where you're going to become the very aspect of the word that will not return void. And it's going to accomplish that which it was sent for. How many of you want to accomplish that which you've been sent for? There's a word hanging over your life. You. And it's been prayed. It's been prayed ever since Genesis. All the way back. He knew the hairs on your head before you were born. Come on. Some of you guys don't believe this. This is the word of God. And listen, it says in the manner which he sent it, it's going to prosper. What does that mean? It says when you get a hold of the reality of what I'm praying for you, when you get an understanding, you're going to become the house, you're going to become a home like my home. When I dwell in your presence and you become that which I called you to be, you're going to prosper. Everything you touch is going to prosper. 
Your businesses are going to prosper. Eric's business is going to prosper. You know why? Because that's what the Lord's called him to. He's going to prosper. Who else in here has a business? Who feels called a business? Your business is going to prosper. Come on. For you shall go out with joy. That's a great promise. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. Right? And so there's a, you can see the progression here um, in Isaiah 55 about the word of the Lord going forth. The word of the Lord going forth. The word of the Lord right now is going forth. And it's accomplishing much. So when you pray, you have to know that you're, the words that you're hearing, the words that you're thrusting forth, and Jesus saying, you're call, calling those things not as they are, but as they will be. You're calling them into reality. What's out of line in your life? What's the Lord want to bring into alignment? Right? Come on, think about it. What is he praying over that matter? And what are you agreeing with it? Right? It's in the place of prayer. It's in the place of intimacy. It's in the place where, where first love is being cultivated. I'm going to turn to John chapter 2. We'll see how far we get. I've got a bunch of notes, but we're not going to get through all this. And I won't try and get through all of it today. We're, going to, we're devoting three weeks to this. Uh, just us discussing the place of prayer. And listen, we're not even going to be able to scratch the surface. Um, but, but, but God will give us what we need and he'll give you what you need in order to get them uh, where he's taking you. John chapter 2. Now, John chapter 2, he turned, Jesus comes and he does his first miracle. He turns water into wine. His mother tells him what to do. Come on, moms. You need to be telling, telling the guys in this community to be turning water into wine. Right? Why aren't you turning water into wine? Come on. My time has not come yet, woman. She, hey, he did it anyways. <laughs> so in John chapter uh, 2, uh, in verses 13 through 22, Jesus is about to cleanse the temple. He actually cleansed the temple twice. And he walks into, uh, and, and, and this is during the Passover. This is in uh, one of the major feasts of, the, of Israel. If you've ever gone to, to Israel during Passover, uh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, if you ever go, if you're hungry and you go on Passover, you're going to be extremely disappointed. <laughs> it's not a feast. It's not a feast. Uh, it, the Lord is there, and it's and praise God for that. Um, but there's these little fried things they have there. Um, gosh, what are those called? You know what I'm talking about? Man, I'll, they're really good. Sorry about that. They got a little sidetracked. But so he walks in there and he finds he finds in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, now listen guys, this was premeditated. He didn't he didn't just pick up a whip, he made a whip. Yeah. So if you think Jesus isn't isn't into dis, uh, disciplining you and putting you over his over his uh, uh, knee and just the way you spank your, your sons and daughters, listen, Jesus will spank you. He will discipline you. Jesus loves you. And I've heard all this. Well, Jesus loves me. And, and, and he's, the, he's a lamb. Listen, he's a lion. Yep. And he comes to purge his house. And I'm telling you, if you don't think he's going to purge the house of God, uh, we are sorely mistaken. And so he's coming here and he's making a whip. He, and he's driving, up, driving them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Come on. Who wants to be eaten up with zeal yeah. this morning? Mm -hmm. The Lord will eat you up yes, he with will. zeal. And it's, I, oh, I love it. The, and zealous ones, man, they, they're, they typically are the, the hardest ones to be around. <laughs> because... Zeal with wisdom is great, but some people don't all, they don't get zeal and wisdom at the same time. <laughs> that's why, listen, that's why we need mature people, mothers and fathers, because there's a company of a generation of zealous young people that are getting saved and um, they're going to need you. And listen, let me just go ahead and say this. If they don't have you, you know what's going to happen? They're going to be destroyed. I want you to bear the weight of that. Yeah. That there's there's a generation coming through here that if you're not ready to receive them, if you're not ready to see past who they're not and ready to mother and father them, we will see a generation fall away from God. That's right. 
passionate about that. Jesus is passionate about that. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? Here comes the pride. And Jesus answered and said this, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and it will you raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus has said. So here we find ourselves. This is, this is the modern day when Jesus is coming. There's a temple. The glory of the Lord has filled that temple and the priest couldn't minister. Um, and I believe that is still for today. The glory, the, there is the, there is the, Jesus is the glory of God. Yes, he is. But there is a manifest glory that comes in a meeting when heaven invades earth. And it's, it's, it's called the Shekinah glory. When the Shekinah glory comes, people hit the deck. They hit the ground because of the pure holiness of God. And we've not yet seen that, but we will. And when that comes to this region, which we're ushering it in, that's why we're the East Gate, because we're ushering in the glory of God. Um, and we're preparing the way of the Lord. Um, things begin to change. Things get serious. And so Jesus is addressing this organization of the day, of the hour. And he's speaking to this temple and it's, guys, it's not so much about their merchandise as it is about their heart. The, the father is grieved. Do you know why the father's grieved? Because they're doing business. They're doing earthly, fleshly transactions that are not well and pleasing to him. See, the house of prayer is his home. And when you defile God's home, the land's defiled. When you defile God's home, the people are defiled. When you defile God's home, the people are connected because God cannot inhabit. He cannot come down and dwell with, with the sinful people. And so the sin of that day, because the merchandise and because there were traditions of man and the religious aspect of men, which at one point in time, this was a good thing. Everybody, you got to understand this. If not, you're going to get really religious. At one point in time, altars were good. At one point in time, the tabernacle was good and it was, it was, it was progressive. It was cutting edge. At one point in time, the temple was cutting edge. But then came this man, Jesus, that was the standard in which would never change. He was the temple. He was the living temple. He was a living organism. And he began to call men unto himself. Right. Tax collectors, prostitutes. He began to call the least likely. Let me tell you something. Who are the least likely in your life right now? Come on. Jesus is building his church in, around them. Yes, he is. And if you don't have eyes to see it, you will miss it. And then he's giving us, he's given us the keys. He's given us the church. He's given us, he's given us the most violent warfare. He's given us the greatest weapon of prayer. So if you have an issue in your life right now, I'm going to tell you right now that it's from God. And it may be sent by the devil, but God will use it to bless you. God will use it to turn it around. God will use it to turn the tables. And God is, God is, uh, we're going to end here. God wants his house of prayer. God wants his church to be a house of prayer. God is not interested. I, 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 I would 100% believe this. Every prayer movement, it, it births things. It brings the body of Christ into another place. It brings shifting. It brings transformation. Before there is a move, there will be a, the move of prayer. Before there will be anything that changed, somebody prayed. Before a region can be transformed, somebody has to be praying. Somebody has to lay their head on the rock. Somebody has to be that, that, that Jacob that, that has the encounter that changes the city's name from Luz to Bethel. And, and that begins to be where the house of God merges with the gateway of heaven. The house of God will merge with the gateway of heaven as the church merges with the house of prayer. As these two expressions, not, not the church as we know it, the church as God intended it. Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, equipping the body that are built around the house of prayer reality. We've seen these two separated. We've seen one house of prayer and this is the church. Um, God is bringing them and he's marrying them and what, what he joins, let no man separate. Right. We're, seeing, we're seeing community. Listen, community nowadays is built around the prayer room. It's built around the communion with heaven. You wanna know what it means to have community with one another? The greatest level of community right now is not gonna be by programs in a church. It's not going to be about what you like about the church or what you don't like about the church. It's going to be about people that have been with God and you're on the same journey with them and you're having community with them based upon a sent reality of being part of this apostolic community. Because God's raising up messengers. He's raising up sent ones. He's raising up people 
that have been so gripped in prayer by the home of heaven that they want to make their city a home for him to come and dwell. And so he can tabernacle in our midst. He wants to do it in our personal lives. He wants to do it in our marriages. He wants to do it in our corporate expression. He wants to do it in our region. Go ahead and stand with me. Rachel, will you just come up here? Listen, guys, um, building the house of prayer, it looks like spending time with God. I, I felt the Lord come to me and say to me the other day, is this in your eyes is nothing. If we look around here, you're going to miss it. But we are called to this region. We're called to undergird. We're called to shepherd. Many of you are called to open up your house. And actually, you're ministers. You're, God's building something in you. God's not just building Eastgate to be a great place to come to. It, although it will be that. He's building it upon you. And it's prayer and intimacy with God that we're going to find that he's making a house. Bethel, where he said, this is none other than Bethel. There was no house. But yet God called it, he called it the house, the house of God. I mean, the home, the home of heaven had made its way on earth. Who wants your house to become a home for heaven? Who wants your kids to grow up living a heavenly reality? This is what you want. You don't really want an old expression of a temple to go. We don't want to go back here. We don't want this. We want Jesus and we want to be the man and the woman that God's called us to be. We want our families to grow up being taught by God. It's not the church's responsibility to teach your family about God. It's yours. It's mine. As a, as a father, it's my responsibility. But God says the promise was every person would be taught by God. And yeah, we'll play a part in that. But we've put way too much emphasis on man. Man has a part of and honor that. But the Lord's changing things, guys. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for the heart of John chapter 17. I thank you that Jesus modeled what it meant to know you. He, he had a personal prayer life. He prayed for himself. Listen, some of you say, I can't pray for myself. It's, it's I need to pray for other people. That's religion. You must pray for yourself. The Lord is investing in you. You must have a personal prayer life. You must go and take your needs before the Lord because... If you don't know that he'll meet your needs, you will not be able to really have faith for him to meet other people's needs. If you don't know he values you, you won't know he values others. And Lord, you model what it meant to, to really step into intercession, to pray for those, Lord, that those believers, those ones that have been given by you. And you even said, Lord, they're not mine, they're yours. Father, I pray for... For the, for the communities, God, the, re, the, the region. Lord, this morning that we would come to the realization that these people are not ours. They're yours. And they would be kept by your glory. And as you and I are one, Father, Lord, let them be one. Let us be one. Break down sectar the sin of sectarianism, God. Let us see with kingdom eyes. And lastly, let us pray and intercede, Father, for, the belief, for those that have yet to believe. Those that are being called out of darkness into glory. Father, give us a heart for the lost. Give us a heart to see them in, in being saved, healed, and delivered. Lord, I ask that this, this company, Lord, this apostolic company would, Lord, would develop an apostolic witness. Father, I ask that a, a, an encounter, a fresh fire would just fall upon every person of East Gate. Father, let it be known in this community, in this region, that we have been with you. That we've touched and we've tasted, that we've very handled the very word of life. Lord, let us grab hold of you and not let go. Until you fully shake us of our insecurity. Of our error of doctrine. Father, I thank you that there's many, many, many that are coming into a John 11, 11 reality in this region, that there is a spirit of awakening coming. And as the 
the book of Isaiah said, I have set watchmen on your walls that will not give me rest until Jerusalem becomes a burning city, a lamp, a burning torch. Raise up burning torches, Lord. We want the wild ones. Give us the wild ones, God. And may they be well and pleasing to you. May you just receive an offering right now of the incense of our hunger, of our desire to meet with you, of our faith and righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you guys to pray for me tomorrow. I'm traveling to Ardmore, Oklahoma. Uh, they've asked me to come and minister at a, at a school, a, a, a global school there. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to, to, to connect, I believe, with, with the Lord's doing there, what he's doing here. Um, they're a small uh, company of people like ourselves that just are going after a city. And uh, the pastors there are just really amazing people. Y'all love them. Y'all, y'all, you'll get to meet them. Uh, we'll be doing stuff with them. Um, probably, I would think, frequently. And I really feel like there, there's a place there. The Lord said uh, last year, a couple years ago, that, that we would be uh, stewarding the glory in certain cities. I believe, listen, I believe this with my heart. There's people in this room that you're going to be part of that. Whether you're here or whether you're there, the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few. But pray. Pray. Pray for me because there's a great effectual door opening, but there are many that oppose me. That's what Paul said. I'm asking that you pray because I believe God's going to do a work there. And, and um, I believe it's. Uh, part of who we are. Listen, do not let go of what God has called you. It's worth it. Step into detention. In Jesus' name. Presses 
in the presence of God and it presses out everything that's not. You know, hugs are healing. Hugs are healing. There's so much healing in a hug. And I really feel like that the Lord wants us to practice that this morning. And, you know, I believe this is the word of the Lord. Find somebody. Go find somebody that you don't know as well as someone else and embrace one another and encourage and listen for a word from the Lord. Thank you for joining us. If you would like to know more about our community, please visit our website at eastgatetx.org.